thank you for the introduction. And um, <clears throat> I want to thank everybody who has uh, preceded me. And I want to uh, start by making a very uh, general observation that uh, I have learned very much in my own experience at Umbran. But one of the things that uh, Professor Heber Rauf has taught me is that if you're going to be in, in a tribe or in a family that's a tribe, you always address somebody by their first name. So when she was talking about preceding people, she acknowledged how happy she was to hear uh, Professor Masumi and Professor Felix. And I'm gonna now say how happy I am to hear Professor Hibba. And any of you wanna to refer to me, you can say you either happy or unhappy to hear from Professor Bruce. So I am, for the purposes of this family and this tribal conversation, I am reducing myself or projecting myself through my first name only. And I wanna to say to everybody, including uh, Dr. Vatadin and uh, uh, his honor, uh, Rajiv, that you all now are, are reduced and also ennobled by your first name. And I wanna thank you all for having a first name and also a very fresh face and introduction here. So Rajiv, of course, gives me a lot of advance notice and he told me yesterday, could you please start or say something in your lecture in Hindustani? So for all those people who, whose first language is Hindustani, I apologize for saying uh, this thing. Um, so for those of you who didn't understand my humble Hindustani, and I would have maybe given a different poem if I hadn't heard this wonderful, very brief presentation by uh, Professor Hibba, where she said, perhaps the key word that we are looking at is not ishq or love, but compassion, rahma or justice, adl. And one of the things I love about Professor Hibba is that I can disagree with her and we both will agree that our disagreements are more important than what we agree on. So I absolutely agree with her that all these three terms are crucial, but I would say that underlying Rahma and Adl and all of the key terms of Islam, including Tawakal, including having dependence on, on the ultimate and the beyond, the, the key word really is Ishq. And what I wanna talk about very briefly in my uh, opening lecture here is the oddity of having this wonderful array of a new tribe, an expanded family as thanks to Rajiv, we now have put together under Umran. And when people ask me, what are you gonna do on Saturday morning? I said, I'm gonna participate in a conference on Umran. And they said, oh, so you're going to go outside somewhere? I said, why? And they said, Umran just sounds like outdoors. So if you don't know Arabic and you don't know Persian and you don't know Turkish and you don't know some Islamic idiom, Umran sounds like just an outdoor expedition. It has no meaning in English. I think it has no meaning in Spanish. But for those of us who are privileged to have been associated with Ibn Khaldun, and I think I take this in a general sense, Ibn Khaldun is a university, but before it was a university, it was a person. And the person is this major scholar from the Maghreb, from North Africa, who gave us the term Umran. So if people who tell me, I don't understand Umran, it's just outdoors for me, I say, well, it's also indoors because it's a very beautiful day actually in North Carolina. And frankly, one part of me would rather be outdoors than indoors, but because of Rajiv and because of Dr. Vahdadeen and Professor Masumi and Professor Felix, and now Professor Hibba, I'm glad to be the fourth person that you're hearing from this morning talking about Omban. And I would like to say that Omban itself is not singular, there is, Umran Badawi and Umran Hadari. And so even Umran itself is not a singular thing. There's not one thing called civilization. There is a civilization that is primarily located in the open expanses. What, um, for those of you who know Iqbal, who of course I just quoted when I quoted the, the, my little poem on Ishq. For, for Iqbal, the important thing is that there always is the desert the desert before you can appreciate the city. So there's no city without a desert. There's no desert that's not given meaning without a city. So there's constantly this play between the natural life, if you will, of the urban and the even different natural life of the rural. And it's both together, not one or the other, or one above the other, or one instead of the other. 
that makes this happen. And so I'm going to now surprise Rajiv. It's very hard to surprise Rajiv, but I'm going to say that when I was thinking about today's lecture, I was saying, is there anybody who's in the recent times has thought differently about this question of Umran and this notion of Ishq? And so I didn't mention this, but I was going to mention this uh, earlier, that even Ishq itself is not a singular concept. Just as there is Umran Badawi and Umran Hadari, there is also Ishq Majazi and Ishq Haqiqi. Now, I apologize to some of you for, for whom Arabic or Persian or Urdu is a strange language, but you've heard now the word Ishq, which is a very difficult concept in itself because it doesn't mean simply love. It means it, an abiding interior passion. It, it's If you think of love as a small fire, this is like a bonfire. So Ishq is a bonfire. It's a huge fire. It can engulf not just a person, but a building and a town and a whole place. So Ishq Majazi is the metaphor of, of love when you see something and you love it like you love a painting or you love uh, a place or you love an experience. But that is very different from Ishq Haqiqi, which has to be one-on-one -on -one, and it can be one-on-one -on -one with an individual or it can be one-on-one -on -one with an invisible overwhelming force whom we call or some call Allah Ta'ala, the one beyond al Ghaib, the one who cannot be, uh, cannot be known or seen, but who is always present in all of our lives. So even the notion of ishq is not singular. There is ishq haqiqi, which is real love, and there's ishq majazi, which is metaphorical or a kind of uh, intermediary or even initial love. But he, this is where it gets complicated. It's only when you experience ishq at whatever level that you can differentiate between ishq haqiqi and ishq majazi, between metaphoric or introductory love and ishqa haqiqi, which is fulfilled or absolute love. So the reason I say I'm going to <clears throat> surprise Ajeev is I was thinking of all this and I was writing to a friend and said, gee, I'm going to be in this really important conversation with people from four continents and we're going to be talking across the US and Europe and we're going to be talking about also someone from Colombia and including Latin America. And of course, we're not going to have only India, we're going to have India and Pakistan and Bangladesh the only part of the world that we're missing is Southeast Asia, but we know that there are some friends from Southeast Asia who are attuned to this. And of course, we have to have um, our good friend, Professor Hibba standing in not only for Egypt, but also for all of Africa. So we have some parts of even the globe that are less well represented than others, but for a single conversation, for a single moment, in what's gonna be a very exciting two days, thanks to the organization efforts of Rajiv and all of his friends and all of the people who work with him, we're going to have a focus on the nature of identity in Umran. And we're going to think about Umran in both the sense of Umran Badawi and Umran Hadari. But we're always, always going to be going back and forth between dyads or dualities. You cannot escape life with death. Death and life are together. And so is civilization in the city with civilization love in the, in the desert as is love that is real and love that is metaphoric. So I was reading this person who is actually a British philosopher. Uh, his name is Michael Murphy. And he's written a book called The Emptiness, The Emptiness of Cosmopolitanism. And I decided when I was preparing my lecture for today that I would introduce a new book to Rajiv so he can read something while he's listening to everybody else. And then by the end of it, he can tell us what Michael Murphy was saying. No, I'm joking. Even Rajiv will give up reading briefly in order to listen to the lectures and to the conversations that will follow. But I wanna say that for those of you who have not heard of Michael Murphy and this book, The Emptiness of Cosmopolitanism, Rajiv has already read the book because he's focused on Kabir and Kabir himself has acknowledged that there are great philosophers before him, one of whom was Nagarjuna. So Nagarjuna, for those of you who are from a different culture, different background than India, Nagarjuna is probably the, one of the greatest philosophers of India. And one of the concepts that Nagarjuna evolved was the notion of emptiness, shunyata in, in Sanskrit. So shunyata means emptiness. 
the total emptiness of everything that is. And you say, well, why would that be important? Because without emptiness, one can't understand fullness. So even in the notion of emptiness, there is an idea that it's going to expand or change in relation to fullness. But if you start with fullness, you feel as if you've already arrived. And this comes back to Iqbal. When Iqbal says, Satan on se ge jahan or bihe, asman or jihe, jahan or bihe, ishke imtihan or bihe, the ishke imtihan. Again, I apologize for those of you who don't know Arabic or Persian or Urdu, but imtihan means the testing, the striving, the goal, if you will, the um, energy of ishq is what keeps going. So ishq is never something where you arrive at the end without starting at the beginning or going through different passages. Ishq is always in movement. And I think this is the nature of what Umran is beyond Ibn Khaldun, as important as Ibn Khaldun is, beyond the distinction between Umran um, 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 Hadari and Arama Badawi, between Ishqa Haqiqi and Ishqa Majazi, when you put all these dualities together, there's one duality that it seems to me is the most important, and I'll, I'll do it in English, it's the importance between being and becoming. So for identity, we think about being, and uh, several people have already mentioned that there's this different notion of what it is when it's personal or local or regional, we all have identity markers. We can say, oh, there are people from four continents and this one's from Colombia, and this one's from um, Chile in, in Northeast India. And this one is from, um, is, is from Bihar. Oh, we can't forget Bihar. There has to be someone from Bihar in all of this. And we can give different regional identities. And then we can say, oh, there's this larger country called India, or there's this globe called Asia. And then there's this place called the world. So we can give spatial identities or, and now I'm gonna embarrass myself, we can give temporal identities. And I can say, holding my hand up, I am the oldest person on this screen. <laughs> and someone might say, I'm older than you think I am. And somebody would say, I'm actually older than Professor Bruce. So if you're 80 or older, you are older than me. But if you're younger than 80, I am the oldest one. So I'm just saying that I'm really pleased to be not only from the United States and probably the oldest person, but that thankfully I'm not identified by either where I'm from or my age, or even the fact that I speak poor Urdu or Persian or English, and that's a little bit of Turkish. I am privileged by the fact that I'm part of this conference today, Umran. And while everybody else is celebrating outdoors, it's a beautiful day. One would like to be outdoors in touch with nature, the birds, the clouds, the air. I'm really happy to be indoors and to be in this Umran conference because the other part of being is becoming. So we all have identity as who we are, what you look like, how old you are, who your parents are. And let me say also for Rajiv, of course, it's not only important his parents, but his grandfather. So it's not only your age and your parents, but it's also the generation before your grandparents, whom you recall when you think of who you identify and how you want to be identified. So all of us have this cumulative, if you will, this window, this index of points at who we are. And you can say that's your identity, that's your being. But all of us also have another part inside of us. And this is the part that links to ishq, is we not only have something about who we have become, it's also who we want to become. It's our striving. And ishq is always about being unsettled and unhappy with the present and always striving for something better. And it's not necessarily that we don't honor, and I want to say specifically to Professor Rao, it's not only that we honor rahmah and adl, compassion and justice, but we strive for something more than compassion in the way in which we've known it, and more than justice as we now have it in either in Turkey or the United States or South America or East Asia or the world. So I would say that one of the things that's wonderful about this conference is that Umran itself has a, a, a double perspective. So Umran is green. And so some would say, oh, it's green because that's an Islamic color. Oh, no, I think actually knowing Rajiv, it's green because it's environment. 
Well, actually, come to think of it, now that I know it's Rajiv, it's green because it's Muslim and environment, and it's friendly for all groups. So green is not just a Muslim color. It's not just an environment color. It's not just Rajiv's favorite color. It's also the color of Rumbalan that pervades this conference. So there may be green outdoors, but there's also green indoors. And so this is the difference between Ishqa Majaz and Ishqa Haqiqi and Ilma Hadare and Ilma Badawi. That the, everything that is a conjunction that has two elements also has the interaction of these. And this brings me to the word that Rajiv will always identify with me and some others too. And that is the word Barzakh. And so whenever I, and this is what I'm going to end my lecture with is talking briefly about Barzakh. And when I mention Barzakh, usually even some of my Muslim students, their eyes roll over and say, oh, yes, it's one of those strange words in the Quran. And yes, let me see. There's, let's see, there's a passage in the quote Surah Rahman, Barzakh la yambariani. Bainahuma Barzakh la yambariani. But between them, Bainahuma, between them, between the two people, I don't mean to give a Quranic exegesis lesson in my first lecture, but just to say that. The two groups that are talking here, again, is two groups. It's not that human beings, it's human beings and jinn. So between human beings and jinn, or between us and a whole other world, which we only sometimes recognize, is a barzakh, which we do not exceed. In other words, there's something which identifies us. The barzakh says, this is who we are, and we can't exceed it, but we can recognize it. And in recognizing the barzakh, the two opposite elements or the two complementary, they may be not quite the same, but precisely because they're not the same, they interact and we're greater not because one becomes the other, but because both work together. So if I had to do just a brief, going back to Professor Murphy, Michael Murphy's lecture, he says that we can't escape, we cannot escape dualities but he said there's a really difference between having diametric dualities. This is, this is Professor Murphy, not Pro Professor Michael, not Professor Bruce. But Michael Murphy says in his book, The Emptiness of, of Cosmopolitanism, it's not that you have things that clash, like communism and capitalism, or East and West, or Orientalism and post-Orientalism, or colonialism and decolonialism. Instead of having these opposites, you also have something else where you have difference or dualities that combine and he calls these, following Nagarjuna, concentric dualities. So you have a circle within a circle. One circle does not become the other, but you have a small circle and then a larger circle. You don't eliminate circles, and you don't make one circle into the other, but you have a circle and then a larger circle. And this whole idea is that you, when we think about Barzakh and bar, what I call Barzakh logic, it's not eliminating duality, it's not saying Ilma Hadari or Omran Hadari and Omran Hadari, one is better than the other. It's that they both have to exist together and each has to supplement, complement, and even compete, but never eradicate. Estabakul bil khair is another saying from the Quran. Estabakul bil khair. And I apologize to those who aren't Muslims here, but it's a wonderful phrase from the Quran. Estabakul bil khair means compete with what is good, compete to do what is good. It doesn't mean you eliminate your competition. It means you recognize you're competing with someone else, including your own inner self, including your own biography, your own background, your own life, your own given identity. You're competing with it to become something better. So the Estabakul Belkhayr from the Quran is not just about competing with Rajiv or competing with Professor Rauf or competing with anybody else is competing with yourself and your own best possibilities. So I think that um, Rajiv, I wanna end by thanking you for having started this meeting and having put together this wonderful array of people. And I'm looking forward to the next conversations we have. And I hope that we all succeed in fulfilling the imtihana ishq that Iqbal called for all of us to try and achieve in our lives. Thank you.